Friend, you did it. You made it to the end of Philippians chapter four. You've made it to the end of this beautiful letter. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of the journey and thank you for continuing to tune in. Uh, I so appreciate doing Bible study with you and encouraging one another. Yes, you encourage me to keep pursuing God, to keep pursuing knowing him and enjoying him through his word. And I hope that we have done that through this study. I know that I have. I think Philippians chapter 4 is a powerful chapter. And in it, I think that we see Paul really summarizes or hits, maybe he, he hits on the purpose for writing his letter. Going back to day one, I, I wish you were here so we could unpack this together and discuss that. But here's where I come away with that. Going back to day one, Philippians chapter four, verse one, Paul says this, therefore, my brothers, and we could read that, brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. This is a family letter, right? Uh, He loves them. He longs for them. He says this, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You who I dearly love, stand firm in the Lord. And we talked about that back on day one. To stand firm is to maintain your ground, um, to hold one's position, to be steadfast and upright. Now, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, he really is seeking to encourage them through the midst of trials. And when is it that we are liable to give way? When is it that we are liable to fall? I think a lot of times it is when we are in trials. It's like, Lord, where are you in the midst of this? And Paul, he, wow, in this chapter, he just gives such a beautiful, beautiful encouragement through the midst of trials. And we know that this comes from a heart of one who has lived it. He is in a Roman prison. He is, he has lived it. He is living it, uh, suffering and trials. And he is standing firm in his belief, in his confidence, in his trust in the Lord Jesus, such that He goes on to say, he goes on to exhort. Remember, there were a lot of imperative commands, and this was one of them. Rejoice in the Lord always. You must rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul's not saying, look, you must rejoice in these trials. You must rejoice in what is troubling you today. No, he says, in the midst of these trials, in the midst of the suffering, you must rejoice in the Lord always. And here's a key. Like I I feel like this is Paul's big secret, although it's not really a secret, but here's a key to standing firm in the Lord is keeping our eyes not necessarily on the winds and the storms and the waves and these troubles that we go through, but keeping our eyes, keeping our mind, keeping our hearts focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, not being anxious about anything, right? That was day two. So he circles all the way back around to that uh, here at the end. He, well, you know what, before I talk about the end, I just want to say that Paul gives himself as an example. He himself rejoices greatly in the Lord in the midst of his suffering. When he receives a blessing as he did from the Philippians, he attributes that to the Lord's care and the Lord's goodness and the Lord's grace to him, such that Paul can say, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I think this is everything I've said thus far is a key to contentment, like contentment and standing firm in the Lord go hand in hand. Do they not? I really think they do. 
So Paul ends day three with, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There we see it. There we see Paul's confidence. This is how he stands firm in the Lord. He has confidence. He's placed his faith. He believes that God will supply every need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Oh, friends, are we believing? Is our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, And the way that it can be, the way we grow in our faith, grow in our belief, grow in our confidence, I think is doing this, studying God, pondering him, meditating on him and his word and who he is. We talked about that yesterday as we did day four and 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 dug into Paul's closing for this letter. We talked about what is it I learned about who God is. Friends, when we come to scripture, that's what we want to do. This is how Paul is confident and this is how we also will become confident in our faith such that no matter the trial, that we are facing today and tomorrow, we can rejoice. Rejoice in what? Rejoice in who? The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we learned yesterday that he is our father. All the glory is his. He is forever and ever. And his, the, uh, it, it's his glory forever and ever. Uh, he is. Jesus Christ is the one who has made us his own by his work on the cross. This is his work. We want to keep our eyes on him. Uh, It's God's grace. God extends the grace to us. This is grace. This is um, a good good will. God's good will freely poured out to us. This is our God, friends. He extends his grace, which enables us then to rejoice in him. True? Yes. Thank you, Paul. And just remembering that he is the Lord. He is our master. Uh, He is Jesus, our Savior, and he is the Christ, Messiah, this King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, friends, can we, will we take away from this week and this study Paul's joy, Paul's reason for rejoicing and place our faith, place our confidence, ask God to help us in our unbelief that we might believe believe in him and rejoice in him and have his peace. Uh, There's kind of my takeaway. I feel like I could continue rambling on and on and on. Like I don't want to stop talking about the reasons we have to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us go and proclaim his name.